Let's jump in today. I will meet you in the Gospel of Luke. I want to begin today with another sermon in our ongoing summer series, The Very Good News, The Really Good News, The Good Good News, whatever descriptor we need to make the news as good as possible. In my opinion, the news is good if it focuses on Jesus and what He has done. And every week, regardless of our topic, if you've noticed, the underpinning is that Jesus has done something. Jesus has forgiven us. Jesus has declared us. Jesus has promised us. He's made us sons. He teaches us about the Father. He gives us an inheritance. As we talked about last week, He brought us grace. He didn't just throw it at us. He brought it to us in his life and his lifestyle and the way that he loved. These, these things to me are very good news. They're, they're, they're such good news that they're worth leaving all the other news to come and follow that really good news. So what we're trying to do every week is not to convince or even to persuade, but to help put in front of us a clear picture of why the news is so good that perhaps it will meet us on our journey, wherever we are on the road, and in meeting us, we'll have an encounter like Paul did, or better yet, like Saul did on the road to Damascus, in which the right man reads the right moment and does extraordinary things. That's that's what I'm praying for you in these messages, not intelligence, scripture stacked on scripture, lots of wisdom, but an encounter. May they leave the garden that day or may they leave that sermon they're watching or listening to and not, maybe they don't have all the answers or maybe they don't remember the points or every scripture that was used. But they had an encounter with the Jesus of that message. They encountered him through that lens. They knew that now they know they're a son. Now they know they can say that he's their father. Now they're starting to realize they have an inheritance. Now they're recognizing that they aren't under the law, but that they're under grace. And that's what I pray for you today that the Holy Spirit would do this work in the way that only He can do it. I want to read one verse to start. Of course, there's going to be a lot more verses, but one verse to start because I think it says it the best possible way to set up really good news. Luke 12, 32. Do not fear, little flock, (laughs) for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There's a lot there I like. It's a little bitty verse, but a lot that I like. One is little flock. I like little flock. We feel like a little flock here today. We feel like a little flock, no matter how big our flock is compared to what's going on around us in the world. We're just this group that he cares about enough to take the time to address us with fear not. Don't be scared. In a world bent on making you afraid, and, and if you've paid any attention to the world, they love to make you afraid. They love to scare you about everything going on, everything from what you're eating to what you're wearing to where you're going to the, what's going on in the government. To, everything's built on fear. It's the, the world's run on it. And you have a, a Jesus in this text that says, don't be afraid. You're my little flock. I got you. I've got my fence around you. But then this, this is the explosive one. It's your father, and we've already taught you you have a father, and we've already taught you your sons, and we've already taught you you have an inheritance. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's happy, excited, and can't wait not to cause you to pay for it or to put you through hoops for it, but to literally give you, hand it to you as a gift. If I give you something... I don't ask for anything in return. Otherwise, we're bartering and trading. But if I give it to you, no strings attached, it's yours. What is it the father can't wait to give his little flock? The kingdom. Okay, well, sounds good. But I've got a theory that most Christians would have no idea how to define that if you were to say, hey, isn't it good news? Let me start over. Hey, isn't it really good news? That your father wants to give you the kingdom? And we go, yeah, that sounds good. And I go, what's that mean to you? And I think the average Christian would say, the father wants to take me to heaven when I die. Because we hear kingdom of God, or as Matthew likes to say it, we'll get into it in a minute, kingdom of heaven. And we think, well, that's a place called heaven. 
where, they're, where Jesus is building big houses right now so that he can bring all of us to our own mansion with a picket fence and all of our pets from our childhood. And we can run around and frolic on the hills of glory someday in a place called heaven and it's dad's good pleasure to give it to us because Jesus died on the cross and his blood is my ticket into a place called heaven. Well, I'm not here to bust your bubble about dead cats and hills of glory. You can have that if you want it, but I am here to tell you the really good news. And the really good news is the kingdom is not something that is over in the glory land that you get to go to after you die, making your Christianity really kick in when you're finally out of here. Jesus didn't say, I come that you might have life someday. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. I like to think of it this way. I've come that you might have life and that it might get started now. Jesus said to his father, Father, eternal life is to know you and the son whom you've sent. Not eternal life is to die and go to heaven. I want to minister to you today a kingdom not of this world. And I want to kind of just pick up right where the conversation in our early service, our early part of the service today led us, which I thought was beautiful. It was the most designed thing I've heard the Holy Spirit do in here in nine months. And what I mean by that is I wrestled this week with how to introduce the kingdom to you. I even pitched a few of them to my wife who has a great ear. She's heard me for 30 years and can say, and did say, that's a little too much. <laughs> She's wise. I'm pitching all my little kingdom ideas and she goes, eh, come up with something else. So I went back to the drawing board. If they're ever any good, it's because I've bounced them off of her and went, okay, that, you know, it could be better. Um, and I have all kinds of way to try to describe the kingdom. And the best I could distill it down to was, you're going to run into people who all the time say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. You ever hear that? I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And it's usually from people that they don't go to church. They don't have a Bible. They don't pray, but they're spiritual. And you go, well, what's that mean? And that kind of means, well, here's what, if you usually ask them, well, I just think there's more to all of this. Don't make fun of that. It might be because there's a kingdom. And even unbelievers, I think, know there's more than meets the eye. Now, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual might be a way of saying, I think there's something out there. Now, they might mean aliens. I don't know. But whatever they mean, I don't think they're far off. You don't have to be religious to know. And I think our group said it better today. You did better than I was doing. There's, a different, there's, there's different lenses. We look through the lens of the natural and we see jobs and money and sickness and death and politics and pain and happiness and whatever. It's all flesh, flesh and blood. Smell it, see it, taste it, touch it, hear it. Sensory, this world. Don't have to be convinced of that. All you gotta do is open your eyes, right? Or just, you feel it. Here we are, it's a real chair. You're sitting in it. But then we have another set of lenses where we know there's more than meets the eye. We know there's something behind the curtain. We know there's something behind the scenes. And we all kind of inherently know it. Even if we're not religious, we're spiritual enough to know there's something behind that. We'll say that kind of thing. There's something behind that. I think what we're talking about, whether we know it or not, is the fact that there's the kingdoms of this world and there's the kingdom of God. And that there are existing at the same time the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. And in my professorial way, I would say it like there's kind of two different planes. You know, there's our time and there's God's time. And our time has clocks, minutes, seconds, decades. And God's time has everlastings and eternals and heavens and in the beginnings. And they're not two different things that exist separate from one another. Like we're over here, but someday we'll be over here. But rather they're two different things happening at the same time, on the same plane. And why do I think this? Because Jesus came preaching the kingdom. And he came preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And he kept saying things like, you've heard it said, but I say to you, I kind of describe that as Jesus saying, where I come from, here's how we do things. 
Or maybe he's saying when I come from. Here's how we do things. Because it's a whole different way to judge time where I'm from. You know, we're in the eternal realm. And when I come from, here's how we love. Here's how we forgive. Here's how we accept people. And we get that all throughout the ministry of Jesus. So I want you to think about two kingdoms happening at the same time. I don't want you to think of them in terms of one is real and one is fake. But I do, for just a few minutes, want you to consider the possibility that the one you think is the most real is the one less real. In other words, the one you can touch and smell and see and use your reason in this world, what if it's the thing, as the New Testament says, that is passing away? This is the thing that is not the realm of the eternal, but there's another. And that if that's true, maybe Christianity is not so much about your individual salvation inside of this realm of time so that someday you can go to a place called heaven. But maybe it's about the faith it takes to see past the curtain, to believe a God loves you, and loves you so much that he has more for you than meets the eye. That he has more for you than just money or stuff or possessions. He has something deeper and bigger and more intense. Okay, well, if that's the case, and I think you can tell I wouldn't preach it if I didn't believe it wasn't true, what does it look like and why does it matter? Well, it looks a little bit like the church but not entirely this is an expression of the kingdom when done correctly but it looks like the ability to see what can't be seen with natural eyes let me show you let me take you to a story in matthew 16 and i want to give you we're going to give two stories today okay i'll just give you a warning so you can kind of gauge how long the sermon's going to be that way you can go boy he's been in that first story too long You're probably right. So at that point, just nod off and we'll move on to story number two. All right. Story number one finds Jesus and his disciples in the region of Caesarea Philippi. I'll meet you in Matthew 16, 13. And I'm going to try not to stay here too long because I want to actually go to a singular moment in the New Testament, a moment that doesn't happen that way ever again. On our way there, we start in verse 13. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Straightforward question. Who do people think I am? That's what it sounds like. Who do people think I am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. I'm pausing as I go through this because I want to make some points and I want to move a little bit rapidly. Okay? Who do they think he is? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. No one says Julius Caesar... Alexander the Great, Aristotle, Plato, or Socrates. They've all lived and died by this time. No one confuses Jesus for one of the great philosophers of secular wisdom. No one confuses Jesus for the world conquerors. Why is that? All autom- already, if we're paying attention, Jesus looks different than the system of the world. No one confuses him for those kind of people, but they do kind of confuse him for a John the Baptist type, maybe an Elijah type, Maybe a Jeremiah type. They see him in the vein of the prophets, but they don't really know exactly what they're dealing with. So Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now the word Christ is Greek for anointed. And anointed in the Hebrew is the word smear. Like You smear the anointing oil on someone. You anoint them with oil. You smear them with oil. The anointed is the Christos in Greek. Christ, the anointed one. Let's take it all the way back. Christ, the smeared one. Smeared with what? A man smeared over with God. That's what Peter's saying. Jesus goes, who do you think I am? Peter goes, I think you're a man smeared over with God. We've never had you before. We've had men who had the anointing poured over their head, but you're the anointing. 
You're the walking, talking, smeared of God, man. Everything about you drips with God. You, in fact, are his son. Big statement. Big statement. This is, this is crossing the Rubicon, <laughs> to use the Caesar illustration. You can't go back. If, you, if, he's the, if he's the anointed one and he's the son of God, you've got to follow him all the way to death, and they're willing to. Now, we can get into an argument about what they thought the Christ would be, but he gets it. He sees it, and he didn't learn it by watching the Caesars of the world, and he didn't learn it by watching the Pharisees, and he didn't learn it by watching the King Herods. He learned it by watching Jesus. Jesus convinced him. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He loved the unlovable. He forgave the unforgivable. He said, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He introduced him to a whole new way of living, and that convinced Peter. Peter said, you're something different than I've ever seen before. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. 17, Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I want to, sh I want to show you that Jesus just verbalized two kingdoms. Flesh and blood, taste, smell, sight, touch, hearing, natural world he get you didn't learn this through the natural world because the systems of this world won't teach you that christ is the smeared one of god but my father who is in heaven and don't mistake jesus for putting the father in a place called heaven but rather in a kingdom called heaven the kingdom of heaven has revealed this to you 18 i say to you that you're peter you're petros you're a stone and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. So whatever Peter has just said becomes a revelation upon which the church of Jesus Christ, I call it the church of Jesus Christ because it's his church, a revelation upon which the church of Jesus Christ is built. I want you to notice Jesus builds the church. Pastor Paul doesn't build the church. Jesus builds the church. You don't build the church. Jesus builds the church. Denominations and non-denominations and thoughts and theories don't build the church. Jesus builds his church. He builds it on the rock of revelation and he calls it in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you the keys and whatever you bind on earth or whatever you bind in this dimension is going to be bound in that dimension. Whatever you bind in this system is going to be bound in that system. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Jesus gives the key being a revelation that Jesus is the Christ. Okay, the beauty of that key is that it's not a key that comes at the end of you fasting long enough. Jesus isn't hiding the kingdom of heaven and it's accessible only to people who tithe well. Or he puts the prerequisite of if you really are serious about living for God, then my God will give you the keys. But rather, flesh and blood won't give you this key. Effort won't give you this key. This world won't give you this key. You can't do enough to get this key. It has to be revealed to you from the Father. The key to the kingdom, which is a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is not a revelation of human wisdom. It's a revelation of faith that comes to us through the Spirit. You were not saved by human wisdom or by intellect, but by revelation that Jesus is the Christ and you decided to follow that even to the death. That I will follow Jesus and that that is my entrance into the kingdom. You and I are not building the church. Christ is building a church full of those who have received the revelation. Let me very carefully tread this out with you. There are churches everywhere, okay? Millions of churches globally. Most of them are meeting today, one way or the other. And they're full of people. And they're all precious in God's sight. And as far as I can see, they're all His children, whether they know it or not. But, I mean, people sitting at the lake today are also His children, okay? They, they, didn't, they may not know they're his children. They may not have an identity of sonship. They may have never believed on Christ so that they have the authority to call themselves the sons of God, but I still, st he cares for them. The church is not necessary. The churches as structures are not necessarily full of people who've had a revelation that Jesus is the Christ. They are full of people who want community, who like each other. 
In some cases, they're full of people who are trying to impress each other, who are trying to figure out a way to get to heaven. In some cases, they're full of people who are padding their resume by letting their face be shown on Sunday. In some cases, they're full of people who are getting a paycheck to do professional ministry. There's a lot of reasons why people go to the building. Not everybody goes to the building because they've had a revelation of Jesus. What we're building are structures. The Garden Church of the Midlands is a structure. We don't build the church of Jesus Christ. He's doing a great job of doing that in you. He's the one building you into a people who can hear his voice and who see him as the Christ. And then we leave the structure and we go follow the Jesus. And we don't not follow the Jesus, but then come back in hoping to see him next Sunday. I just go do whatever I did before I started going to the garden. And then I come back to the garden and I see Jesus. It doesn't work that way for long because if we have a revelation of who he is, we start to take that revelation into our lives. That's us beginning to actually live the kingdom of God. Okay? That's a very elementary way of saying it. I want to try to do better today, and I want to do it by putting Jesus on trial. Here's story number two. That wasn't so bad, was it? It's kind of a warm-up story. That's good, because this one's long. This next one. (laughs) There's a singular moment in the Gospels that never happens quite this way in the New Testament again. And that is where Jesus... Of course, he only goes on trial once, so that alone is a singular moment. But it's a spectacular event because Jesus is is actually brought to trial by three distinct groups. He's brought to trial by the religious, which encompasses the scribes, the Pharisees, the high priests, the law, the chief priest, Caiaphas. All of the religious structures accuse Jesus of being a blasphemer, and they bring Jesus to trial. But he is also on trial by the economic system of the world. Herod. Okay, I'll get into why that is in a moment. And then he's also brought into trial by the empire of the world, Pontius Pilate. And only in the the trial of Jesus do we see all three come at him at the same time. Most of Jesus' ministry, he's battled against religion. He gets into arguments with scribes, Pharisees, lawyers, Chief priests, Sadducees, those are all religious in one way or the other. They all claim to know the Bible and they argue scripture with Jesus. They all claim to uphold the law and they argue interpretation with Jesus. Or they all claim to have the key to God and Jesus says you deny the key to people and you won't even enter in yourself. And that's Jesus against Not religion as a definition, but the religion that's been presented to him. And it so infuriates him that anything about it that keeps people from truth, he'll lose it. He loses it when he goes into the temple and he sees people being barred from access to God and he tears the tables down. And there are so many instances where Jesus, it seems like on purpose, heals people on the Sabbath. Almost like right in front of Pharisees. Like, hey, before I heal you, come over here where... Pharisee so-and-so can see you and then heals them and and you almost see like a sly grin on his face like what'd you guys think about that I could have healed him yesterday but I waited till today could have healed him tomorrow but I went ahead and did it today what do you think and so you can get into these battles about the Sabbath and how the Sabbath that, that that God gave it for rest but we don't stop doing good because it's a day of rest we don't turn it into something legal or some sort of legalism and so Jesus constantly battling those religious forces but he never really faces Herod John the Baptist does, but Jesus never does. The closest he gets is some people come to Jesus and say, hey, stay out of Jerusalem. Herod wants you, wants to kill you. And Jesus goes, you tell that old fox that I have three days to work and then I'm going to be lifted up. And that's as close as he gets. It's kind of his way of, he tosses his own shot across the bow. He goes, we're going to meet up someday. Just let him know what I think of him. He's a fox. You know, he's tricky. And is he ever? And he never meets up with, with Rome. The powers that be. Jesus never gets to go to Caesar. Uh, we don't see him. In, the closest we get is Jesus getting a coin. Give me a coin. And he goes, whose superscription is this? That's Caesar. Jesus goes, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God's what is God's. Which is a great way of saying, doesn't God own everything? You know, it's kind of a trick question. Uh, kind of a trick statement. But we don't see them square off. But at the trial of Jesus, we do. So here's what I want to do. I want to just leave religion alone. I think we've already done enough of it. At the night of his trial, Jesus stands before Caiaphas and they cut him down for 
statements, they bring in false witnesses, all kinds of things happen that eventually get Jesus put in front of Herod and Pontius Pilate. Herod, the head of sort of the powers that be, the economics of the world. Pilate, the system of Caesar, the politics of the world. And Jesus will go to war against both. Let me set that scene for you. Herod is the vassal king of the land of Judea. He's been appointed by the Roman Empire. He did not inherit the throne because he was part of the bloodline of David. Instead, he was given the throne because of political purposes, political reasons. Herod is a quality representative quality not in that he's good but that in it's quantitative he's a quality representative in what happens when the church and the state get married Herod is a Jew and by all expressions in the Gospels he knows the Torah pretty well he's a practicing Jew who has lined the pockets of Roman politicians to receive an appointment that makes him the vassal king over his own religious people he is that marriage of politics and religion that kind of infatuates us, to be honest. I don't say this to our compliment, but to our detriment. We don't think we would, but I'll just tell you, I think we would be pretty impressed with Herod. He made it a long way as a religious man, and he's got the same wealth that the heathens have. And we kind of like it when you can be the good guy who's also the powerful guy. And Herod is so pious, he spends his money building a temple for his own people. This majestic temple at the top of a mountain that sparkles in the sun. That Jews can come and sacrifice animals inside of its walls to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all the while, Herod is on friendly terms with Caesar. Spoken terms. They're so friendly, he has his own seaside resort next to the Mediterranean where he can go away from Jerusalem and rest with his good buddy, with his good buddies from the Roman Empire and, and sort of chill out next to the sea. What a great marriage of the economics of power and money with religion. And when he gets a chance to encounter Jesus, on the night that Jesus is condemned to die, Herod brings Jesus in and starts to talk to him, but he really only wants one thing from him. Do you remember what it was? He asked Jesus to perform a miracle. I want to see if you're what I've heard you are. Herod represents the systems of this world that will not believe what they cannot see. Herod, in some ways, is enlightenment before the enlightenment. I think for about the last 300 years in the world, particularly in the Western world, we've set aside our faith at the altar of the Enlightenment. Because beginning in the early 18th century, the Enlightenment exploded, and out of the Enlightenment came enlightened ideas, ideas that changed the world. And out of it, we got science and technology and the arts, and we got ways of thinking that expanded into the liberties that we see in the world today, and they're great things. But we became so infatuated with them that we began to judge the world through the lens of the Enlightenment rather than the lens of faith. In other words, we now demand to touch it, see it, taste it, smell it, and feel it. And if we can't, it's not real. And we weren't that kind of people. But once the Enlightenment hit, we became the kind of people that have to have everything quantifiable. And if it isn't quantifiable, I don't believe in it. And it's a regression, not a progression of thought. Because what it's done is it's put faith on the back burner. Faith then becomes the thing for ignorant people and weak people. People not smart enough to figure it out have to have faith. At least this is the way the world sort of pitches it. Like if you were better at this, you wouldn't have faith. You'd just be better at this. You wouldn't have to believe God for this stuff. You'd be believing in your own talent, your own ability, your own stuff. What they're really saying is, is you'd believe what you could see and you would never believe what you couldn't see. You'd believe what you could feel and you'd never believe what you couldn't feel. And that's what Herod asks for. Just show me a miracle. Now, I don't want to spoil it for you, but Jesus refuses to do that. <laughs> he doesn't show Herod a miracle because he's being asked to do the same thing the devil asked him to do in the wilderness. If you be the son of God, 
turn these stones to bread. I kind of like to think that Herod brought rocks into the room and laid them in front of Jesus and went, can you do this? Can you, can you turn that into bread? Because if you could turn that into bread, I'll believe you. I'll base my faith on the God of action, not the God of promise. And the world's ready to base it on the God of action instead of the God of promise. Church, I want to warn you, it's very easy to fall into that trap where we think the only way we're going to be able to do this is if we can show them something. If we can show them something, they'll believe in us. If we can show them something, they'll follow us. But if we really pay attention to the Bible, they won't. They'll only follow you until your next attempt to show them something. And when you fail to show them something again, they're gone. That's the story of the children of Israel. We believe God shows us a miracle until he doesn't give us the miracle we want. And then we turn to believe that God doesn't like us at all. So Jesus refuses to do this miracle in front of Herod, and Herod sends him to Pilate. Now, Pilate, Pilate's an interesting character. Pilate is appointed as the procurator of what the Romans call Palestine. Now, the Roman Empire of I don't want to bore you with history, but you kind of need to see this, okay? The Romans would conquer everything up to Britannia, through the land of the Gauls, what is Germania, and most of Western Europe. They would conquer down to Northern Africa, across the Mediterranean, and all the way to the edges of Palestine, just east of the Jordan River. And then you could draw a big circle up into Asia Minor and then back up, all conquered by the Roman Empire. As far as they were concerned, the known world. <laughs> I mean, they knew there was stuff outside of that, but they didn't care. And so when they talked about the world, that's the world they were doing, the world we've created. On the far eastern side of the Roman Empire is the little backwater of Palestine. It's not much... It's full of sectional conflict and regional battles between a bunch of people who think it's their land and a bunch of people who think it's their land. Doesn't sound much different than today. And the Roman Empire doesn't really want much to do with it. However, it's theirs and they don't give anything up that's theirs. That's the way the world works, by the way. I don't give anything up I don't have to and I don't give anything up I'm not either conquered for or paid for. Okay. And so Rome appoints Pilate. Pontius Pilate, a low end of the pole Roman ruler who never goes to the seat of power, Jerusalem. He pretty much stays in his little palace in Maritima on the coast, and he just shows up when he has to do something for the government and couldn't care less about a 33, 34-year-old carpenter from Nazareth that they throw in front of him in the middle of the night. He's probably a little ticked off that it's, say, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and he's got to deal with this. And I want to pick up the story with you in John chapter 18. Let me meet you there. Here's our, here's our run to the end today. What we're going to do in the next few minutes sets us up for the next few weeks. Because for the next few weeks, we're going to preach and teach the kingdom of God. And we're going to do it in a way that is going to incorporate the entire body of the New Testament to try to show us that the kingdom is not someday but a reality that we can start to live out of because it's our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. What I've tried to do today with you is lay out what the kingdom might be, and I've tried to lay out to you that there are keys to the kingdom called revelation. Jesus is the Christ. Once you get that, you're ready for the kingdom. But I want to make sure that before you leave today, you can at least spot the difference in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world because it's going to smack you in the face when you walk out of here. And if you can spot the difference in Christ, you'll never be deceived. Really, never be deceived? Yeah, Christ isn't a deceiver. If you can spot the difference in the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, when it's right in front of you, you'll never be deceived by the kingdoms of darkness and you'll learn to live in the kingdom of God. And over the next few weeks, we're going to show you what happens if you lived in the kingdom of God. And the way to do it is to watch Jesus on trial. Standing in front of Pontius Pilate in John 18, 33, Pilate entered the praetorium again, and he called Jesus. And he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me? I'm going to leave this alone because there's a lot of work to do on this conversation. And I'm going to go to 35. I'm just, that led us into these questions. Pilate answered and said, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, and here's our title. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from there. I want to pause for a moment and I want to see if you caught it. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, what would my disciples do? Why does Jesus say they would fight? Because the kingdoms of this world can be, de- can be spotted by their quickness to fight. That's Jesus. He goes, my kingdom's not from here. If it were, we would act like the kingdoms you're used to, Pilate. He's talking to a Roman. They got this whole big circle on the, on the map. How'd they get it? Did they just walk up to people and go, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks for that land. Study your history. <laughs> How Rome got it was at the tip of the sword. They conquered with power and authority and death. And it's the only way to rule the world in their eyes. And so Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king and where are you from? And Jesus goes, well, I am a king and I have a kingdom, but it's not of this world. Here's another way to say that in the Greek. My kingdom won't grow in this world. The soil you have is tainted. It's poison for my kingdom. I got to grow my kingdom in another soil. And you know it's not like yours because my, my disciples won't turn into soldiers. They won't fight. Your kingdom is a, is a power structure in which fighting is part of the system. Pilate therefore said, verse 37, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I came into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears... Oh, I'm sorry. Everyone who's of the truth, hear my voice. I want you to pause before you read the next verse. I want to reiterate something very important because this gets you ready for what you're about to read. Jesus said, I come into the world to bear witness to the truth. I'm witnessing to the truth. I'm not here to give you the truth. I'm here to be a witness of a truth that's already real. It already exists. I'm just here as an emissary. This is an amazing statement by Jesus. I'm here to witness to a truth that's already real, whether you know it or not. And if you follow me, you can hear it. And you can see it. Dare I add to Jesus and say it this way. If you follow me and you believe on me, you can feel it. You can touch it. You can taste it. You can... Not in the way that you do this world. But it's just as real. It just doesn't grow in your soil. It's not as understandable by you. I come to witness of that truth. Now what's Pilate's response? Verse 38. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Okay. <laughs> now, what is truth is maybe one of the greatest secular questions ever asked in the Bible. What is truth? But I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't say anything. He doesn't respond. Now, I said for a long, long time, you can go find a lot of Paul White sermons where I said the following, okay? I'm not dissing what I said. I just am growing. (laughs) In other words, that's me going, I wasn't wrong. I just wasn't as right as I needed to be, okay? (laughs) Maybe I was wrong. (laughs) I would say this. I would say this. I would say Jesus doesn't say anything because he knows if he keeps talking, Pilate will be convinced of the truth. I don't believe that anymore. And here's why. Because the truth Jesus came to give isn't something you convince people of. You see, faith isn't to be convinced of. Jesus doesn't talk because he's going to let Pilate answer his own question. Because he's going to so frustrate the power of the empire that the empire will reveal what it thinks is truth. If you listen long enough, the world will tell you what they think the truth is. Now listen, I'm not, your pastor's not talking about true. Get that out of your head. True 
and truth are two different animals. There's a bunch of stuff true. Okay? And there's a bunch of stuff false. None of it's the truth. It's true that there's probably one way that's better than another way when it comes to politics. It's true that there's, you could go left or you could go right. Those are, those are true. None of them are truth. Whichever way you decide to go, you're not going to land on the truth. You're just going to land on what's true. True is of this system. The best this system can do is get it right once in a while. That's the best they'll ever do. But their foundation is not truth. I want to show you what their foundation is. Hold on to your hats. It's right there in your Bibles. What's the foundation of the system of the world? Even our favorite systems. What is truth, Pilate asks. Go ahead to chapter 18. I'm sorry. Chapter 19, verse 7. John 19, 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law according to our law. He ought to die because he made himself to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? That's a good question. Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Okay, here it is. Pilate's ticked off. I've asked you and I've asked you and I've asked you. And I keep asking you what's the truth and I keep asking you where you're from and you're playing games with me and you're ticking me off. And I'm a Roman and I'm at the top of the food chain and I don't play around. Get the system mad enough and they'll tell you the truth. And here it comes. Pilate said to Jesus, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify and the power to release you? And in his first one... He gave the truth according to the systems of the world. The only thing the system of the world has the power to do is rule at the end of the sword. I want to scare you to death. I have the power to kill you. I have the power to set you free. That's it. This whole structure of the world is built on fear and intimidation and power. And the reason Jesus didn't answer when asked what is truth is because Pilate could not accept what the truth actually is. The truth according to the kingdom of God is that in order to defeat the system of the world, you have to step into the best thing it has. And the best weapon it has is death. So Jesus steps into the cross and spreads his arms and takes the whole thing into himself. And for three days, Pilate was right and Jesus was wrong. Real power wins again. And then the stone rolls away. Now you're a Christian today because the stone rolled away. Here's what I mean. If the stone hadn't rolled away, Pilate's right. Jesus is wrong. Ignore all of his stupid sermons because they're pie in the sky. It's dumb. When you hear supposed spiritual leaders or Christians, <laughs> I must go ahead and say that, saying how unimpressed they are with Jesus and his teachings or his attitude because he's not strong enough for them or he's not powerful enough for them or he's not leading angel armies. Just realize that what you're hearing is an infatuation with Pilate's version of truth over Jesus' version of truth, an infatuation with the kingdoms of this world and a disappointment in the kingdom of God in which Jesus says... I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I'm the only way to come to the Father. Hey, little flock, fear not. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Guess what Dad wants you to have? Me. And how did I get there? I walked into the teeth of the best thing the system of the world had to offer. And three days later, I exploded out the other side in a new creation. <laughs> and you're following that Jesus who calls you into that kingdom. And you say, well, what does that look like when I leave this place? What good can that do me? 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to close. Are we done preaching the kingdom? Oh, no, we barely even started. It's why we need weeks. So we're going to take weeks preaching the kingdom. But, oh, what a good place to end. I, I hope you caught this. As you're going to 1 Peter chapter 2, I hope you caught this. 
Did you catch that it wasn't Jesus on trial? It was Pilate on trial. Pilate thought Jesus was on trial. He even washed his hands of him and went to bed. I won again. I always win. We always do. That's the way this goes. And Jesus went to bed as well, into the bed of death. And Pilate had reason to think he had won because he didn't realize he was on trial. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Here's what you're called into, church. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, get ready, this is the way the kingdom works. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten but he committed himself to the one who judges righteously. That doesn't look like the systems of the world, does it? That's not how you respond. You hit me, I hit you back. You cut me down, I'll cut you back. You know, we love that stuff. You put one of mine in the hospital, we send one of yours to the morgue. You know, that's, our, that's the natural responses of this world. That's the system of power and authority. Jesus steps into it. 24 who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Oh my gosh, there's so much good theology in this verse. Jesus bore what sin? All of the sins of this system, all of its reciprocity and its revenge and its violence and its anger and its need to win and its need to dominate and its need to destroy. And he bore it in his body and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's the only thing they know how to do. But I'm here to show them a better way. And in that, he took all of the wounds into his body on the tree so that we could die where he died and we could live where he lived. And by his stripes, we are healed. I come up in the church and the only way I ever heard this verse quoted was when we took the anointing oil and we brought people up front and we anointed them to be healed of sicknesses and we said, by his stripes you're healed. And then we prayed for them and not everybody got healed. And even as a kid, I was bothered. I went, well, if his stripes were good enough to make me righteous, shouldn't they be good enough to make me healed? And there's whole divisions of the church that specialize in that way of thinking. But I, I want to tell you how I see it now. I don't think the scripture is deceiving you at all. I think that we've just put healing in this dimension. And that all we think of is being healed of stuff. But it says he bore my sins in his body so that by his stripes I could be healed. Healed of what? Whatever sin did to me. Jesus is the healing for whatever sin did to me. What did it do to me? It abused me. It lied to me. It stole from me. It squashed me. It cheated me. It, it, it stole my hopes and my dreams. It made me a slave. Jesus came to heal me of that slavery. He came to heal me of that pain. If he didn't heal me of being hurt, then I'm going to just try to hurt people. But if he healed me of being hurt, then the kingdom wins. If, if, if he didn't heal me of being crushed, then I'm going to go out and try to crush somebody. And the kingdom loses. But if he heals me of being hurt and I don't crush somebody, the kingdom wins. If I was abused or molested and then I live inside of that and it ruins all of my relationships, then the system won. It just crushes people and it destroys another generation. But if I could be healed of it, and not let it ruin my next relationship. The kingdom wins. That's truth. This is why we ask people to come to Jesus. So when people go, hey man, if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna hammer them about the afterlife, why are you even telling them to get saved? And I think you don't have any idea the kingdom of God. If you actually believed the kingdom of God was real and that Jesus had brought it, then this verse would be enough of a verse for you to try to lead people to Jesus because they're carrying hurt and pain and shame and anger and unforgiveness and jealousy and greed and lust and a lot of it they could just let go of if they could just get healed. And the healing is not just cancers and tumors and broken legs. It's broken hearts 
and crushed souls and minds. And you have the answer and his name is Jesus. And the key is not fasting and praying and giving and going and doing, but it's believe. He said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. My father told you that who is in heaven to see Jesus as the smeared over one is the key into the kingdom of God. That's a hard plan to land, the plane to land for me. Like I'm flying and want to go, oh, let's take another lap. I got more to say about the kingdom. The permission to a flyby, you know, and buzz the tower. So I'm going to stop and we're going to just save some for next week. There's a lot of kingdom goodness. And next week we're going to get into the fact that there's the kingdom of light and there's a kingdom of darkness and they're happening simultaneous and opening your eyes to who you are in Christ introduces you to a whole new way of thinking and confusing the two opens you to the spirit of Antichrist. And I got some really good news for you. The Antichrist is not an individual who's looking to put a tattoo on you at the end of time. The Antichrist is a spirit alive and well on planet earth that dwells in the kingdom of darkness and is opposition to the spirit of the sun. And I want to show you how to find the difference and never have to be deceived again. And you can quit watching the news looking for the Antichrist and you can open your spiritual eyes and realize he's been fighting you for a long time. Okay? Really good news. Really good news. Would you bow your heads with me? I know I've held you a long, long time. It's a Sunday morning. Your stomachs are going crazy. You just can't wait to get out and go see the kingdom of God in your neighborhood. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for all these beautiful sprouts in your garden of grace. I thank you that, Father, you have brought us together to see one another, but to see Jesus in one another. I thank you for the Jesus I get to see in my brothers and my sisters today. I thank you for the fact that they're all on a journey at different spots in the road, but it's the same Jesus. So I thank you by, Father, asking you to reveal yourself to them in the way that only you can. My sermon can really just introduce them to thoughts and concepts. That's one thing. But you introduce them by revelation to the power of the Holy Spirit. May you do that. And all who will listen. Father, we live in a kingdom of this world. But we're citizens of a kingdom not of this world. Start to show us the difference. May we never conflate the two. May we recognize you for who you are. Because if we can just learn the authentic, we'll spot the counterfeit in a heartbeat. Father, forgive us where we've been infatuated with the kingdom of this world. Forgive us where we've specialized in the counterfeit. And we've let the counterfeit convince us that it's superior to the true. Forgive us. So that, Father, we can open our eyes to the truth of Jesus and his way. May we pay attention to when you say, this is how we do it where I come from. And may we make where you come from where we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this week's program. If you would like more information, please visit our website at paulwhiteministries.com. Here you can find thousands of sermons, shop for Pastor Paul's books and series, and become either a monthly partner or a one-time donor. You can also visit our church website at midlandsgardenchurch.org. For written correspondence or to donate by check, write us at Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 1030, Flowery Branch, Georgia, 30542. Join us again next week here in the Garden of Grace.